how to turn on my own microphone <laughs> and that I, I require staff assistance. Uh, I mention that because years come and go, times change, but the fundamental commitment of the Union League Club to community and to country doesn't. And so just as we bid adieu and welcome, we always are concerned with the common wheel and the flourishing of our communities, uh, be they here in the Loop, uh, the city of Chicago, the region, the state of Illinois, the Midwest, and indeed the world around us. So Lord Maynard Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, who I think I can safely say would not have fallen into the monetarist camp, however, brilliant guy, had a wonderful comment, which I think takes us right to our speaker. And Keynes observed that, you know, and he was all Oxbridge and highfalutin and Exonian accent and all of this. Keynes cared very much about regular people. Keynes cared very much about jobs and income and production and prosperity. He saw them as fundaments for human flourishing. And he made the point at one time in his life that there were a lot of people out in the world, very practical people, men and women, who probably had never seen a textbook in economics. And they hadn't necessarily considered the significance of a banking system or disintermediation. And they considered themselves very independent. But in fact, Keynes said, they're depending on us to do what we do correctly. And that's not ever going to change. Whether we're talking about our neighbors in Canada or our allies around the world, our friends in Japan, both of whose countries are represented here today, uh, or our own fellow Chicagoans. For our prosperity of the entire community and for the flourishing that can result therefrom, folks like our speaker have to get what they do right. And Dr. Bullard recognized that at an early age, taking time off from his fraternity frolicking at St. Cloud State, which we know a lot about. We're not gonna get into today, but he got into, thank goodness, quantitative analysis, econ, econometrics, and that all led to Bloomington, Indiana. How many IU grads, proud IU grads? All right, let's hear it, okay. And uh, none prouder than our speaker today. None more committed to community and country than our speaker today. Join me now in a big, I, want, I don't want a tepid. I'm not into tepid, and if it's tepid, you're, we got people in the back. David Cohn's gonna take you out. I wanna hear a Union League Club welcome for somebody who cares about community and country. James Bullard. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I'll do my best to channel Lord Keynes in my, in my talk here. Um, always one of my favorites is the, uh, the, the complete quote, I think, is that, uh, uh, I don't know if I can get it exactly right, but ordinary uh, men and women are the slaves of some defunct economist. I think that's the, that's the quote. So. Um, uh, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction, and, and again, uh, what a great group here. I'm looking forward to the q and I'm going to talk about 
uh, current events and uh, current monetary policy. And uh, I'm just going to walk you through uh, some arguments that I've been thinking about recently. And then uh, we'll go from there. But when you get to the Q&A part, feel free to bring up anything that I don't talk about that you think I should have talked about or uh, that you would like to talk about. I'm happy to do that. But this is about the current stance of uh, US uh, monetary policy. I should say before we start that uh, the, the Fed does have a framework uh, review uh, that's going on. Uh, the flagship conference starts tomorrow here at the Chicago Fed. Uh, there'll be uh, lots of fanfare around it. And I do think it is best practice for the Fed to review its monetary policy framework on a regular basis. We're, we're sort of copying the Bank of Canada, which I think sets an international standard here. Every five or seven years, uh, you should sit down and think about, well, why do we do what we do? And has the world changed? Should we th be thinking about different ways to conduct monetary policy? That's the spirit of the, uh, of the framework review. We're also getting input from uh, both from sort of an academic perspective, but also from a non-academic uh, perspective, uh, uh, sort of various stakeholders and groups that might be interested in monetary policy. We're listening very carefully to what they have to say as well. So um, you might hear more about this in the next uh, in the next two days, and it's right here in in Chicago, right down the street at the Chicago Fed. So let's get back to current stance of uh, monetary policy. Um, I think. Uh, if you don't want to listen to the whole talk, you can just read this slide here. And then uh, uh, I first I'm going to talk about uh, global trade disputes, which have obviously been in the news. Uh, I think the worry is that those disputes may be more protracted and may take longer to resolve than what we previously thought. <clears throat> so I'll talk about that issue a little bit. Um, the U.S. economy is expected to slow in 2019, and I've got a killer graph to uh, show exactly uh, what that means here, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, we've got inflation expectations, and actual inflation is too low. It's below target uh, inflation. Uh, the Fed has a 2% target, but uh, currently inflation's running below and has been running below really pretty much consistently since 2012. Uh, a whopping seven years uh, of below target inflation. And really globally, you've got low inflation as well. So I'll talk about that issue. You've got a yield curve that uh, looks more inverted uh, than it has. Uh, we've been flirting with inversion, but it's now uh, moved more decisively in that direction. We'll look at some pictures there. And so I think that if you take the whole, the, the sum of these first four bullet points together, I, th I think it suggests that a downward move in the federal funds rate or our policy rate would be warranted uh, soon. So let's, uh, let's just go through these one at a time here. Let's start with the trade, uh, the point on trade. So um, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that recent developments in global trade negotiations uh, certainly make it seem like it will be more difficult to reach a st stable uh, global trade regime than previously thought. So the global trade regime, I think, uh, was considered stable in some sense. Uh, countries had agreed to whatever they had agreed to, and no one was, was agitating uh, for change. Uh, we're now in an environment where there are lots of negotiations going on, not just between small countries and big countries, but between major players around the globe. So I would call that the trade regime. And it looks like uh, it's going to be harder to get agreement on that uh, regime. Uh, and I can talk in mo at more length about that in the Q&A if you want. But uh, I think it's the uh, uncertainty around this that's likely to chill global investment and global growth. Um, and as important as it is inside the United States, it's a far bigger concern outside the United States where uh, more, most of the countries outside the United States obviously are smaller economies and so they're very concerned about the products that they trade on international markets and what's the future of their supply chains and so on and so forth. So this, uh, the uncertainty around the uh, global trade regime is, is uh, chilling global investment and, and slowing global growth. If you look at the U.S. in particular, 
and just do the numbers just based on individual goods and just based on tariffs, uh, you're going to get small effects on the U.S. So the, I would call those the direct effects of tariffs on the U.S. macro economy. That's because the U.S. is a big economy and the amount of trade uh, is not that big compared to other, other countries. Uh, some countries are 50 percent, 100 percent. We're only 15 percent, you know, trade. So relatively uh, small. So the direct effects are relatively small. But nevertheless, uh, these uh, uncertainties can come back to bite the U.S. economy because of uh, global financial markets. And certainly uh, our Fortune 500 firms earn at least 50 percent of their profits outside the U.S. So it, it really can come back uh, to affect uh, U.S. production as well, but it not probably not through the direct effects, probably through the indirect effects through global financial markets. <clears throat> now, U.S. monetary policy can't react day to day uh, because one negotiator said one thing and then the other negotiator said the other thing and then the other negotiator said the other thing. That's not a reasonable way to run uh, monetary policy, but an environment of elevated uncertainty uh, surrounding the global trade regime could be a negative factor that could come back to haunt uh, U.S. macroeconomic performance. So I think that's the spirit in which you should take uh, what I'm saying. If, the uns if we're going to have uncertainty about the global trade regime uh, for a long time, then that's a negative factor for global growth, and that probably feeds back uh, to the U.S. as well. Now, let's look at growth in the U.S. Uh, for uh, 2019. I think uh, many of you know, if you follow financial markets, that growth has been expected to slow. Uh, but the first quarter actually surprised to the upside. So I've got some comments on that. <clears throat> if you look at the year-over-year -year growth rate, the U.S. Uh, real GDP, which is our favorite measure of overall production in the economy, has been growing at 3.2%. Uh, at an annual rate. So uh, that's a great number, uh, and that's a success story for the U.S. Uh, people said it couldn't be done. Well, uh, we did get 3% growth. But uh, 2019 as a whole is expected to be uh, slower than 3%, something slower, maybe substantially slower. And if you think that these global trade uncertainties are important, then you might think that that's a downside risk or an, an additional negative factor that's going to slow growth more than we were already anticipating uh, for 2019 uh, as a whole. So here's the killer graph. Uh, so again, you should wake up if you haven't been paying attention here. So uh, this killer graph uh, goes from March 17 all the way out to 2021. So this is far in the future here. And uh, this is the real GDP growth rate, percent change year over year. And here's where we were in March of 2017. This gold line is what the committee thought was going to happen over the next two years. So the committee thought uh, the FOMC, of which I'm a member, uh, the median per, uh, uh, of the uh, participant on the committee thought about 2% growth or a little bit better than 2% growth for 2018 and 2019. Instead, this is what happened, the blue line, this is the actual data, we got all the way up to 3% growth. So I've labeled this the upside surprise in the U.S. economy over 2017 and 2018. And it has been very successful. and. My argument that I've, if you follow me that I've made in the past is that it is exactly this upside surprise that has allowed the U.S. to come off of the zero interest rate regime, move the policy rate up quite a bit. Uh, we're at 2.4% uh, uh, today. Uh, so we've been able to do quite a bit. We were at zero on the policy rate. But on the strength of this faster real GDP growth, we've been able to normalize uh, monetary policy in the United States. But uh, the committee expects uh, now, this is the, the projections that just came out this past March, projects uh, GDP to slow down. By the end of the year, the year-over-year -year growth rate will be uh, only 2% and slightly below 2% going out into the future. So this is the expected slowdown part, and that's pretty substantial, a percentage point. Uh, considering that the first quarter was already 3%, you would have to have 
growth about 1.6% or so in the last three quarters of the year in order to get to this kind of number for the end of the year. Uh, so that would be kind of below potential growth uh, for the U.S. economy by most people's uh, estimates. Uh, and then if you put the trade uncertainty around this, you know, you might worry that this is somehow going to go down faster than you thought, and that would be the, the concern that we're looking at here. These kinds of forecasts notoriously have tremendous uncertainty around them, so you should take them with a, with a grain of salt here. Look how far off we were here, you know, full percentage point off. So, um, so uh, but this expected slowdown is what people have in mind, even though the, the actual number is quite high right now, they're worried about looking ahead. Okay, you can go back to sleep, Kilograph is uh, over here. Okay, so uh, what about inflation? and inflation expectations, my main point here is that the markets are not expecting very high inflation. They're not expecting us to hit our inflation target, and uh, inflation has been coming in too low for years. <clears throat> um, we have a stated inflation target of 2%. Uh, the target is stated in terms of so-called personal consumption expenditures inflation. That's a broader measure uh, of inflation. That's the committee's favorite measure. Um, if you look at market-based inflation expectations and adjust them appropriately to get to get to this kind of a PCE measure of inflation, they're below target. And that's the thing about that is we're not seeing much inflation, despite the upside surprise in the U.S. economy in 2017, 2018, and the first quarter of 2019. Despite all that, you're still seeing inflation below target and surprise to the low side. Um, so I think that's very concerning for the credibility of our inflation target. And credibility is the currency of the realm in central banking. You must have credibility, otherwise uh, things fall apart. Just ask countries that don't have credibility and, uh, and look at what happens there. So it's very important that uh, if you say what, you know, say what you're trying to achieve and then achieve it. So here's the graph. This goes all the way back to 2012. Uh, the blue line is the headline inflation number. Those are the prices you actually pay. Uh, the gold line is the so-called core, the X food and energy. So throw out a lot of the prices that you have to pay all the time. Uh, but uh, we like the core measure because it kind of gives us an underlying trend idea. Uh, but it doesn't really matter which, which line you look at. Uh, so this has all been below the inflation target. And if you landed from Mars and uh, you wanted to get at what the Fed's inflation target was, you'd be pardoned if you looked at this graph and said, well, I think their inflation target is 1.65% because that's the average uh, over this era. So, you know, it's low. Uh, it's not terribly low, but it's low. And just recently, it's been low again, so we hit the target for a little while, then we came back down again, despite two years of upside surprise in the U.S. economy. And here's the inflation expectations. So this is uh, from our, uh, some of you might be traders down the street here at the Mercantile Exchange or elsewhere uh, in, the, in global financial markets. There is a TIPS market, that's uh, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. If you do some calculations based on that, you can get a reading on inflation expectations. That's what these uh, lines are here. It's that daily, uh, daily data. The uh, gray line is the two-year ahead expected inflation based on this data. The gold line is the five-year ahead expected inflation based on this data. And the blue line is the not the next five years, but the five years after that, so way out in the future expected inflation. And uh, first of all, why aren't all of these at 2%? They should, if you were really credible as a, as a central bank, these would all be at 2%. But they're saying no, uh, and these are real people putting real money on the table here. They're saying, well, 1.6% or something like that uh, over these kinds of time horizons, two years, five years, or the five years after that. So this is uh, concerning for Fed credibility. We'd like these things to be centered better around the 2% target. 
And I think and inflation expectations, you know, you might say, well, who cares? But in the, in the macroeconomics world, inflation expectations are a big part of how the economy uh, actually works. And expectations generally are a big part of how the economy works because what you think is going to happen in the future determines all your decisions that you, all of you are making today about your investments and your saving and your consumption. All right. What about yield curve? Uh, we've got some yield curve issues, and then I'll uh, have a few other comments and we'll be done. Uh, the yield curve is an important piece of information for monetary policymakers. Uh, inversion of the yield curve has preceded recessions uh, during the post-war era in the U.S., uh, not necessarily uh, around the world, but in the U.S. Um, some portions of the yield curve are inverted today, and that's become more pronounced just in the last several weeks of trading. And in particular, the 10-year yield, uh, which is about 2.11% uh, before I came here uh, this morning, uh, is below the, uh, the policy rate that we set, which is 2.4%. So it looks like financial markets think growth is going to be slower in the future and inflation will be lower in the future than what the committee thinks. That's usually a kind of a mismatch that isn't a good sign for the future of the U.S. economy because monetary policy looks uh, too restrictive in this environment. Here's the picture, uh, the different measures of the yield curve. Here's the 10-year minus the three-month, 10-year minus the one-year, five-year minus the two-year. There are zillions of ways to do this. Uh, uh, <laughs> Here's the Fed near term forward. This is something that was uh, put together by some staff at the Board of Governors. Uh, but they're all, you know, here, this goes back to 2014. These are all going down, 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 down. Now they've actually crossed zero here and are going into negative territory, which is the inversion uh, situation. That's usually been a bad sign for, uh, for U.S. economic prospects. So what should we do? Um, we're facing, as policymakers on the Open Market Committee, a slowing economy with escalating global trade regime uncertainty. Actual inflation is below target. Inflation expectations are also uh, below target. If we eased now, we could help recenter inflation expectations at the 2% target should be a good thing for Fed credibility and for the 2%, uh, the credibility of our 2% target. It could also provide some insurance in case the downturn was uh, in global growth was more severe than we uh, had previously expected. And even if you didn't get this, uh, suppose the global growth concerns go away, even if you didn't get that, that would just mean inflation would come back to target a little bit faster than otherwise, and so you'd still be uh, doing something good from a monetary policy perspective. So this is my argument for why it might make sense to uh, make a rate adjustment at this point. <clears throat> Let me cheer you up with some economic history here. Uh, <laughs> The Fed has done this correctly uh, once in the post-war era. Uh, that was in the mid-1990s, uh, boom times for the U.S. economy. Second half of the 90s, especially a uh, tremendous boom in the U.S. economy. We were talking about paying off the entire national debt, you might recall, some of you, in 2000, 2001. That didn't happen, but we were talking about it. Um, so monetary policy was successfully normalized in the middle of the 1990s. The policy rate was increased uh, 300 basis points in a single year between early 94 and early 1995. It was the worst year in bond markets in uh, the post-war era. Uh, but that amount of normalization is very similar to the 225 basis points that we've just got done with in December of 2018. So they're kind of roughly comparable uh, normalizations as far as the scale uh, goes here. 
If you look at the 90s, uh, the FOMC subsequently backed off a little bit and took back some of that normalization, about 75 basis points, during the latter part of 1995 and the early part of 1996. The economy did not enter a recession, uh, despite people being worried at the time. The economy did not enter a recession, and it actually set up a boom for the U.S. economies in the second half of the 19. 90s. So this shows that you can do a policy rate normalization without actually getting into a damaging outlook for the U.S. economy, and I'm hopeful that we can achieve this again uh, this time around. So here's the picture, another killer graph, so you'll have to wake up again for this one. So the, um, this goes from 93 out to 96 here, so this is a replay of the mid-1990s. And here's the policy rate on the left scale here. So the policy rate was at 3%, considered at the time incredibly low, ridiculously low, uh, artificially low, all kinds of things. Uh, we went all the way up to 6%, 300 basis points uh, over a single year. Uh, so the normalization was complete by the time you got to the February 1995 meeting. And then subsequently took some of this back here, about 75 basis points, and landed at five and a quarter percent. And that set us up for the rest of the 1990s. This is real GDP growth, which is on the right scale over here. Uh, real GDP growth was, was ramping up all the way up to 4%, similar to uh, today where you have a boom. That enabled the committee to raise the policy rate. But then growth was slowing down during this period here, and the committee got a little bit nervous and pulled back a little bit on the policy rate, and then everything leveled out. GDP growth went to 4% for the rest of the 1990s. That's how we started talking about paying off the entire national debt. So it did really make a big difference. This is, a, this is the best example in the post-war era of a, uh, a soft landing for the U.S. economy and a normalization of monetary policy that wasn't associated with later, uh, later recession. So I'm hoping we can replay this in a current environment. Okay, let me finish up and conclude, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, again, you can ask questions on anything under the sun or on what I just said here. Uh, and just to remind you what I said, um, we're facing an economy that's expected to slow going forward. There's some risk on the downside that the global trade uncertainty uh, will uh, make the slowdown in, in the U.S. economy be more severe than it otherwise would be. Uh, in addition, we're, we're already in an environment where both inflation and inflation expectations are below target. You've got this inverted yield curve where the market seems to think the committee's not going to hit its inflation target, and they're expecting slower growth and uh, slower, lower inflation going forward. So the market is saying the current policy rate setting is inappropriately high. So a downward uh, rate adjustment may be warranted soon in order to recenter inflation and inflation expectations at the goal of 2% and buy some insurance against the, uh, the case of a sharper than expected slowdown in the U.S. economy. So I hope this is helpful. And uh, I'm anxious to hear your comments and to hear what, uh, your questions. So thanks very much. You've been very attentive. Thank you. Thanks very much, President Bullard. We'll start right here. Please give us your name. Hi, I'm R.J. Yant. I'm probably the least qualified person here to ask. I've never taken a course in economics. Uh, but tell us how the uh, Fed balance sheet figures into all of this. Yes, an excellent question. I did not talk about the balance sheet in this talk. Um, you can see my uh, remarks from, for those that are interested, you might check out my remarks from Hong Kong about 10 days ago where I did talk about the balance sheet, but I'll give you the, the short version here. Um, the balance sheet after the crisis uh, got very large, uh, was up to as large as four and a half trillion. Um, it has moved to a lower level since then, but it's never going to move back to the pre-crisis level, which was uh, about 800 billion. 
The reason it's not going to move back to the pre-crisis level is three factors. Currency, which used to be, you know, 700, very round number, 750 billion, now 1.7 trillion. So right there, it's a doubling of the amount of currency outstanding. Um, the Treasury general account used to be $5 billion before the crisis, now $250 billion. And reserve demand, which before the crisis was maybe 30 to $50 billion, now thought to be $1.2 trillion, much bigger reserve demand than previously. So if you add up those numbers, uh, you're going to get a balance sheet of the Fed that's going to be north of $3 trillion. That's why it's going to be so much bigger than it was in the past. And you might ask, why is that reserve demand so high? We used to run the U.S. economy on $30 billion. Why do we have to have $1.2 trillion? The answer to that is the Dodd-Frank Act put a premium on high-quality liquid assets and we're also paying interest on reserves, which we did not before the crisis. So big financial firms are saying, well, if, you want, if, if it's a requirement by law that I hold high quality liquid assets and I can hold reserves and I can get paid interest on them, then maybe I'd like to hold some reserves. So reserve demand is much higher than it was. And I think there's also been a sea change in thinking at the Fed is saying, well, if we can provide a lot of liquidity to the economy, why not provide a lot of liquidity to the economy? Why, why force uh, the economy to trade the liquidity in short supply? We don't want to do that because that might precipitate a crisis somewhere farther in the future. So we'd like to follow Milton Friedman's advice and satiate the economy with liquidity. So that's some of the thinking behind the very large, what seems like a very large balance sheet compared to the pre-crisis era but is actually a very reasonably sized uh, balance sheet given that the circumstances have changed on the three dimensions that I mentioned. Probably more than you wanted on that, so. <laughs> Professor Bullard, Holly Liss with BTIG. Ah. You mentioned that the Fed may be borderline at risk of credibility with respect to inflation. So do you lower interest rates and lower interest rates and maybe again to try to stoke that inflation or do you actually change the inflation target? In other words, why is 2% the magic number? Uh, the 2% inflation target has become an international standard since inflation targeting swept the world in the 1990s, led by, at first by New Zealand uh, and then other uh, economies including uh, the UK and many others around the world. Um, the ECB, uh, European Central Bank, uh, has an inflation target so-called 2% or less. Um, uh, Bank of Japan has now uh, has a 2% target, so it's become an international standard. You could argue about whether that's really the right number or not, and there is a huge uh, academic literature about that. But I wouldn't, now that we've established a standard, I don't really want to uh, deviate from it. Once you say that you're going to achieve something, I think you should achieve it. Um, uh, maintain credibility. That it's the stability of the expectations that is really beneficial to the economy because it facilitates planning and investment, saving over longer horizons in the economy, which is exactly what you need for the price system to be able to allocate resources in the right way. What, what you want to get rid of is longer run uncertainty about what the central bank is going to do uh, because that could, kill, that could kill off any investment plans or savings plans that you might have. So, um, so we've established a target. Okay, great. Let's maintain credibility of that target and let's hit it. Okay, over here. Uh, my name is Sam Ogrizovich. Uh, Dr. Bullard, could you please comment on the extent to which Climate change is part of the conversation at the Fed, either at your local level or more broadly across the country. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, this is a topic, I think, that is, generally speaking, far from monetary policy. Uh, there are a lot of things we can't affect, and it's certainly not uh, in our lane, so to speak, uh, to try to address this question. Uh, there has been some 
talk about um, uh, making sure that financial institutions are taking proper account of the value of their longer run assets, uh, depending on uh, how the uh, uh, climate issues evolve over time, and so that is certainly something uh, we would take into account, but it's not something we can uh, affect directly, and, um, and so it's a little bit out of our, our lane. Question back here to your left. Uh, Julian Emanuel from BTIG. Um, as far as average hourly earnings uh, running gains of the low 3%, is the Fed satisfied with that number? And if not, sort of how do we get to a different number and, and what would that be like? Well, I'd like wages to grow as fast as possible <laughs> for everybody in the economy, and I want uh, high wages. Um, I do think that the, uh, the kind of the best measure in my mind of uh, uh, wage growth is the employment cost index because that takes into account everything in total compensation. That's growing uh, a little over 3%. Um, it should, it's a nominal number, so it should grow at the rate of productivity growth plus the rate of uh, price growth, productivity, which is good news, has picked up a little bit in recent quarters. Uh, maybe one and a half percent on average in recent quarters. Uh, inflation looks like, according to my graphs, looks like it's also running at one and a half percent. That gives you three percent. So it looks like wages are very much in line with productivity growth plus inflation. Okay. Uh, Dan Mazur, thanks for taking my question. The back to the balance sheet. You, yes. I, I believe, the Fed ex is expected to continue the taper into the fall and just what your view is, an interim step before cutting rates to slow or stop the runoff of the Fed's balance sheet. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't put that here as an option. The committee talked extensively about balance sheet policy earlier this year and did come to an agreement on how we wanted to proceed. Uh, I'm not inclined to reopen that debate uh, at this juncture, I think uh, I think we have a good plan in place. Uh, we're going to have a large balance sheet, no matter how you cut it. Um, uh, we do need to find out where this reserve demand really is uh, over the next uh, year or so. So I think we've got a, a good plan on that dimension. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't mess with it at this point. Hello, my name is Drew Levenfeld. And I have a question regarding uh, population growth. If we're in a, uh, I, since my youth, we've been trying to hold down the world's population. Uh, but I've heard theories that if you hold down the population, that affects uh, growth because you have less people to buy stuff and you have less people to produce stuff. Uh, what's your opinion on that? And does the Fed consider that? Well, it's a, uh a good question. Um, demographic factors, I think, have become more and more important in thinking about uh, global economies. For a long time in macroeconomics, they were kind of pushed into the background. Uh, but nowadays, you have all these economies that, that are aging significantly. Uh, Japan is one, the US uh, a little bit less so, uh, but many economies around the world, not least of which is China, because of the one-child policy. Uh, so you've got these demographic factors and people have wondered uh, how, much is of, how much is that affecting um, economy's ability to grow and so on. So I, it's very much an area of active research. It seems like it should be simple, but it's not simple at all. Uh, it's actually quite a complicated uh, question. Historically, uh, in the history of economic thought, it's been a, it, there have been two sides to this because you had very large co countries with very large populations and fast population growth that did poorly. And sometimes you've had other countries that had uh, rapid population growth and they seem to boom. So it isn't obvious that there's a factor, you know, that the demographics are going to go one way or the other, um, you know. So it's, it's just unclear, I, I think. You can't just say population growth all by itself uh, is going to push one way or the other on growth. Okay. Hi, Tom Kravitis. Uh, the Bank of Japan owns nearly 80% of that country's uh, domestic ETF market. Do you 
do you have any thoughts uh, on on that type of situation? Are there the, the risks it presents, and does that imply anything to the as as far as the um, extraordinarization of um, of central bank policies in the last ten years? Yeah, the. Um uh, Swiss National Bank is another one that they own a, or unless they sold it, uh, they've owned a, a sizable chunk of Facebook, for example. Uh, so uh, this is something I'd very much like to see uh, the U.S. Uh, stay out of. I think it's fraught with uh, political difficulties. Um, this committee has stated that we want to have a treasuries only uh, balance sheet in the long run. And I think, uh, as far as I know from public comments of many uh, members, uh, that's the direction we're going to go. That's where we've been historically. We've tried to have a neutral uh, portfolio uh, so that we're not trying to pick winners and losers uh, throughout the economy. Oh, hello. My name is David Seidman. I have a question about the national debt since you brought it up several times. Uh, how does the Fed, or I should say, does the Fed assume that we'll ever curtail it in any way, shape, or form as it is making its decisions? And then secondly, since we're in Illinois, uh, how does the Fed consider the rising state and municipal debt in its calculations and decision making? Uh, great question. So the U.S. has uh, over uh, one GDP worth of, uh, worth of debt that would have been considered uh, extraordinarily high. It has been higher than that in the past, in the aftermath of World War II, uh, about 125 percent of GDP. Um, you've got uh, Japan, I hate to keep bringing up Japan, but they're, uh, they're uh, over 200 percent of uh, GDP. Uh, the European countries, a lot of them are 100 percent of GDP or more. Uh, the debt burden can be crushing for uh, smaller countries with less credibility uh, where markets lose faith that the government is willing and able uh, to service the debt. Uh, I don't think we're close to that kind of uh, level today, so I don't really think uh, uh, that's why we're not having any trouble. Not only that, but as of this morning, uh, we could borrow for 10 years at 2.11 percent. Well, that's a pretty good rate, uh, despite the fact that we, you know, apparently have a high debt load already. So, um, uh, willingness and ability to uh, to pay is the critical thing. Many countries that default on their debt don't carry anywhere near this much debt. Uh, you know, they'll default at 30% uh, of GDP or 20% of GDP. The political processes in those countries shows that they don't have the willingness or the, to tax or the ability to tax uh, to pay off even that amount of debt. Then investors start to run, and then uh, yields go way up, and, and you get into a crisis. So um, I don't think we're uh, near a crisis uh, today. I do think that macroeconomics in general has to do a better job of thinking about national debt issues. Uh, I think the previous advice that we gave has proven to be uh, not granular enough. Uh, and so we need to get better on this dimension. Authors like uh, Olivier Blanchard have talked about this uh, recently. Uh, he's formerly MIT, I guess, or maybe he's MIT now. Um, but he's talked a lot about debt. Um, so I think uh, this is ripe for a rethink. OK. Hi, I'm Bill Zeiler. Uh, Dr. Bullard, thank you for your time today. Uh, your last comments actually take us in a little bit more of a global direction, and I'll follow in that vein. I'm curious. If you think that interest rates globally uh, are an important pricing mechanism, and if so, how concerned are you about the distortions that are introduced with something like $10 trillion of global debt uh, trading at negative interest rates? $10 trillion at negative interest rates. Ouch. <laughs> That's what savers say. Uh, so uh, I, I am concerned, uh, well, concerned. I think cognizant of the global interest rate environment, and I think that's been a, is and should be a very important factor for U.S. monetary policymakers. A lot of people come to me and they say, well, 
the policy rate's at 2.4%. That seems crazy low. But it's not low compared to the international environment where German rates are negative all the way out the curve and Japanese rates are negative all the way out the curve. So you've got um, a big chunk of the global economy uh, with negative uh, interest rates. So we're sitting at, uh, you know, in the 2% range for uh, out the yield curve. That's quite a bit more uh, than other countries are, are paying on their, uh, uh, on their debt. So, um, you know, is it important? Uh, absolutely, it's important. Uh, I would rather not get into negative interest rates in the United States. Uh, I do think it causes problems in, uh, in markets, uh, and it's uh, not something that's easily handled at the retail level. Uh, by the banks that have been involved in Europe uh, and elsewhere. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, could you talk about the trade-offs of having a flat interest rate uh, versus using it for policy decisions? And then secondarily, um, if financial institutions are borrowing uh, from the U.S. government at the federal funds rate, um, does that mean they can't find a secondary market to fund them, and if so, are we subsidizing uh, financial institutions? I, I'm, I didn't get the gist of the first, what was the first question? So uh, could you talk about the trade-offs between keeping the federal funds rate flat over time versus using it for policy decisions? Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, keeping the, uh, the policy rate at a fixed value over time is called an interest rate peg policy. Um, so I, uh, I have to laugh because one of the very first classes I took in ec economics, the professor said that Babylonia had a fixed interest rate policy, uh, the interest rate peg. Uh, supposedly 12%, uh, all borrowing and lending in the kingdom, 12%, no matter what. Uh, and they were very successful for hundred, hundreds of years. So that was his argument about why you should have an interest rate peg. Um, the interest rate peg got a very bad name in the 60s and 70s when the perception was that the Fed tried to hold interest rates too low for too long and it led to global, uh, global inflation and four recessions in 13 years and all kinds of disruption in the global economy. So uh, out of that era, it, it became um, considered uh, the norm that you would not ever follow a fixed interest rate policy, that you had to adjust the interest rate with changing economic conditions, and that totally makes sense, that uh, productivity is bouncing up and down over time, labor force is bouncing up and down over time, you've got other shocks hitting the economy, so the interest rate should move around over time, and what the policymakers should be doing is uh, moving their interest rate around uh, to, to adjust for these real factors that are occurring. Um, and also, you got the idea that you want to hit the inflation target, which was absent, absent in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so it's only in the modern era where you started to think about uh, uh, really focusing monetary policy on what it can do in the medium run, which is hit the, uh, control the amount of inflation in the economy, that monetary policy can't affect uh, big time macroeconomic factors like the rate of productivity growth, rate of human capital formation, uh, rate of investment, all these things are, uh, can be affected temporarily but not permanently by, um, by monetary policy. So, um, so the idea that you should uh, adjust the, uh, the interest rate uh, as shocks come into the economy has become the norm uh, in policy making circles. Uh, there are some radical theories that suggest otherwise but they're, right now they're on the fringe and the other guys are in the middle. Are we subsidizing, uh, I guess, financial institutions maybe with the uh, interest on reserves policy? Uh, the argument there has been that we did not pay interest on reserves for, uh, for decades in the U.S. up until 2008. Uh, banks always argued that this was a tax on the banks because you were, uh, they had to hold some of their assets as, as reserves and these were non-interest bearing 
uh, reserves, and so they were being taxed uh, relative to being able to uh, earn interest on those. We've remedied that, arguably, with the interest on reserves policy, so that tax, the argument that you're taxing the intermediation sector is no longer there. That would be the, uh, the argument that we're not subsidizing the financial intermediation sector. Just a couple left. Uh, Dan McKay, Dr. Pollard, thank you very much for your comments. Sure. Could you provide some color on the Fed Chair's comments last night from 60 Minutes about the labor participation rate? particularly the number of people have left the workforce and not applying for jobs. And obviously, I think you mentioned that the U.S. has one of the lowest labor, labor participation rates now in, in the industrialized world. How does it affect your modeling, and what are you looking at from the causes for that? Yeah, labor force participation is another uh, variable that historically in macroeconomics was pushed into the background. I, in the first 20 years I was in macro, I didn't hear anybody talk about uh, labor force participation. Now it's become a preeminent uh, variable. And I have to say something about this. This is, if you talk to groups like, like your group here or groups like this all around the country, you know, people keep coming back to the idea of who's participating and who isn't participating, who's staying at home, who's working. And uh, over time, that really starts to penetrate very slowly, but starts to penetrate, you know, gosh, I don't really have a theory about that. You know, I'm just assuming, you know, it's kind of an Ozzy and Harriet world, right? Dad goes to work, mom stays home. That's the way the models are set up. They're set up like that. And they don't really take much account of uh, household labor supply changing over time. So. Uh, and yet, when you look at the data, obviously this is changing over time and different people are choosing to do different things, so you should be taking that into account in your model. So this is a great area for uh, current and future research. It does differ dramatically across countries, uh, and uh, I don't know if that's cultural norms or if it's really incentives in the different countries uh, with different policies uh, about who's going to participate and who's not going to participate uh, in the economy. So uh, great, it's a great topic, and I think we have to get much better in macroeconomics at, uh, at getting a handle on this variable, labor force participation. Hi, Dr. Bullard. Thank you again for, for speaking. Just a question on inflation expectations, just given that it's such a big part of your rate cut call, in that um, you know, when we look at the market pricing of Fed funds, as that's priced in greater interest rate cuts, tips have gone, break-evens have gone lower. So the market's effectively saying the Fed doesn't have the ability to influence inflation expectations. And then secondarily, how does that compare to the recent Michigan survey data, which is at cycle highs, and then the impact of tariffs on inflation? Uh, I think the Michigan survey has drifted down over time, but maybe it's ticked up recently. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, so the, when you survey people, they always think there's quite a bit more inflation than there really is. Uh, so they, they tend to predict inflation really quite high, 3%, 3.5%, 4%. It's different between men and women. Um, and then uh, over time, those expectations have drifted down, but very slowly. Uh, I like these tip space uh, because this is the market uh, traders that are really trading directly on this uh, on this issue. And the one thing I like about this chart, I put the Chairman Powell's remarks in Atlanta on January 4th. That's where he indicated that there might be a change coming in monetary policy. And you could see that there was a downdraft uh, in December and early January uh, in inflation expectations. I would interpret that as the market thought the Fed was uh, too hawkish, not just because of the December rate increase, but because it was a December rate increase coupled with further <clears throat> rate increases projected out over 2019 and 2020. We took all those increases basically off the table by the time we got to March, but this was the beginning of that uh, at the Chair Powell's remarks in Atlanta. And these all recovered uh, a fair amount, especially the two-year here, uh, recovered a fair amount. So I think we can uh, influence inflation expectations. That was a more dovish move in the market, and uh, it was reflected in inflation expectations. But lately, we've had more of a downdraft here, which I would interpret as the market thinks 
that policymakers are too restrictive given the data as it's come in and given the various risks that have, uh, are encumbering the U.S. economy. Uh, Mr. President, I'm uh, going to take the uh, advantage of the chair here and ask you, especially since you were in Hong Kong just 10 days ago, uh, your view of the disputes between our country and the People's Republic of China, uh, your view of the possibility... Don't get me started. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, everybody, we got to go. Time do you have? <laughs> All right. So your view of the dispute and your view of the uh, possibility of resolution, given the tactics you're seeing on both sides in the last, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, and what broader lesson are we learning about these two very large economies uh, as, as we are continuing to grow and China's having a little bit of trouble? Okay, well, thanks very much uh, for asking that. I was in Hong Kong. I would say, generally speaking, uh, the atmosphere there was pessimistic on a trade deal, um, but uh, obviously, I've, you know, I talked to a certain slice of, uh, of uh, uh, financial markets and policymakers there. But um, I'll give you Jim's view of this. I actually said in Hong Kong that I thought China should agree to everything that the U.S. is asking. And I think I was taken as, uh, as a comic uh, statement of some kind. But I don't think it, I don't think it is. Uh, my view is like this. Uh, the U.S. has been a global leader in liberalizing trade around the world since World War II. And the reason we took that strategy is we had big corporations that wanted access to foreign markets. And at the same time, those foreign players wanted access to U.S. markets. So you needed a leader to get that deal to occur. And the U.S. was that leader. And uh, we did allow a lot more access to U.S. markets. And we did get a lot more access for our corporations abroad. The foreign economies were kind of dragged in kicking and screaming because they didn't want to compete against the big famous U.S. corporations and they thought they would get, they would lose to those corporations and so they wanted, uh, they were afraid of uh, the international competition. But as time went on, uh, things have gotten, uh, lots of companies have prospered and done well, some of them with ac access to U.S. markets uh, around the world. Now, China would be uh, one that was uh, off the table in the early part of the post-war era and then came online only starting really in the 1990s in earnest. And uh, they've grown and grown and grown. They're no longer a small economy. They're a big economy on the world stage. So what role should the big economy play? They should be a leader in global trade relations, which means they should be they should be the advocate for free trade around and fair trade around the globe and for enforcing the rules around the globe, just as the U.S. has been the leader uh, in the post-war era. They don't see it that way. They see it as, uh, you know, they want to run trade their way and they want to, they want to run uh, the trade arrangements in their country their way. But that's not how I see it. I see it. They're, they've become the big country. Now they should want access to foreign markets. Uh, for their big corporations, Alibaba would be a great example, and they should want uh, they should want everybody around the world to um, uh, abide by uh, WTO rules and and uh, trade agreements as they're negotiated. So they should be kind of the cheerleader for free trade around the world, the same way the U.S. was a cheerleader for free trade around the world. So it would require a change in thinking on the Chinese side, but that's what I think should happen. Um, because you, you'll never get a small country being the leader on free trade issues, because a small country usually just has a couple of industries. Uh, they're very nervous about their industries uh, getting beat up by foreign competition. They're very powerful politically inside their small country. So it's, it's the, the politics and the economics don't work right for small countries to try to get the free trade agreements that benefit everybody. 
it's only the big countries that have to be the leaders on this and have to always be trying to um, be the cheerleaders for free trade around the world. I think China has reached a stage where it's time for them to step up and play that role. That's why I say they should just go ahead and accept uh, the, US, uh, the U.S. demands because I wouldn't even call them demands. I would say the U.S. standards because they're going to want to enforce those standards uh, going forward in order to allow Chinese firms to have access to all, the, all these other markets around the world. President Bullard, our final question. As we're, look, Tim Smith, as we're considering lowering uh, interest rates, possibly, um, that will lead, that can lead to another asset class bubble. Which asset classes are on your horizon to worry about? Well, it's certainly been a concern and a concern of mine at times uh, in the last decade that uh, we would foster another uh, financial market bubble. Uh, the last two recessions were really uh, bubbles bursting. You had the internet uh, boom in the 90s, which uh, came apart at the, in the early part of the 2000s, uh, led to a mild recession. You had the housing boom, which came apart in the mid-2000s and led to a major global crisis. So it's certainly very concerning if you thought there were financial excesses of that magnitude in the U.S. economy that could come undone. I am not seeing that today. I do not see anything of that magnitude. Uh, I'm certainly keeping an eye on uh, various asset classes and whether we think that they're uh, far out of equilibrium, um, but I'm not seeing anything on the order of magnitude of what we saw either with the internet boom or with the uh, housing boom in the mid-2000s, so. All right, thanks very much. <laughs>